Oh, that's right, right here at Sharp Facets Gallery, 407 in the afternoon. And it is my utmost pleasure to have Skip Shelton with us here this afternoon, the young guy who just happened to be in World War II. Now, how do you figure that? How are you doing today, Skip? I'm doing well, fine. Fine? Yeah. Got another birthday coming up here real soon. Four weeks from tomorrow. Four weeks from tomorrow. And how, how young will you be? Ninety. I guess that means you'll be nine? Yeah. yeah. I, well, I tell people I went in the Air Force when I was nine, so it works well. It works well. Yeah. <laughs> so what have you been doing? Painting every day. and Yeah, painting, climbing painting. buildings, riding a motorcycle, and uh, that's it. That's it? Yeah. That seems like a lot. It is a lot, yeah. yeah. So uh, what, have you, what have you recently been, are you working on something today? or? Well, today I just did a, a little. I did a, the a tower in Furman University. For, uh, somebody had ordered it. Last week we were quite busy doing a mural in a dining room on the home on, on the lake at Harborside. Shirley and I did that mural. And then we... Uh, I just finished a big, big watercolor of Shem Creek, which is six boats, uh, fishing boats. And then we got some more orders to do. We, we work every day a little bit. Some days it's watercolor, some day pen and ink, and some day uh, acrylic. We got them all. And I'll bet you have a lot of orders, don't you? Yeah, we yeah. do. We got an order today. Maybe two today. We did. No chance of you slowing down, is there? No, not yet. I owe too much, too many people. You owe too many people. <laughs> yeah, I can't. I can't. I, I, you know, I got debts to pay. Uh, I, I understand. I understand. Well, that's great. So, um, you know, they had the big birthday bash for you last year. Eighty-nine years young. Yeah. That was a pretty spectacular event. Yeah, had a good time. What made it so spectacular? Uh, the people in it, my band, the girls. Girl students and all of them uh, made a good-looking band, and uh, some of the singers. I just had some talent up there doing things that made it big. That's terrific. That's uh, that is terrific. So, so what do you think about? What do you think it takes to maintain the energy that you have today, Skip? There's a lot of people that would like to have your energy. I think. Well, it's uh, really it's three things. You you got to have somebody. To love, you got to have something to do, and you got to have something to look forward to, and that's the three things that work. If you got something to look forward to, you keep on going. So I know I'll be old someday, but I got too much thing, too many things to do now. So I, I'm not old yet. You know, I think the other thing it's nice that um, with Valentine's Day so close here, it's nice that. To be able to say to have somebody to love. Yeah, yeah, it's pretty, pretty good, and that's that's the big thing, really. Yeah, I think it's really tough for people that get old and they don't have anybody yeah, else. Yeah, I do too. And I regardless do. of family and everything, it's not the same as having your own sweetie, is it? Yeah, that's right. Yeah. So, what do you have? You got any uh, trips or anything planned for this year? Uh, short trips. We uh. We, we go somewhere just about every week or two weeks. Uh, the day before yesterday, we went up to Highlands in the mountains and had a great trip. Did you go on the motorcycle? No. <laughs> just thought I'd no, ask. No, she a little bit cool. <laughs> Surely wouldn't yeah. do it. You would have done it, right? Yeah. Yeah. We, we like to go to Maine, yep. uh, New England, and we went to Florida, yep. to the uh, Key West. But the Maine is really the exciting place, more so than Key West. Wait, have you done any artwork for people up in Maine or anything like that, or is it mainly in the southeast? It's all over. It's all over the United States. You'd be surprised. I got a call from London uh, recently that had a print that I did of John Wayne. For real? Yeah, and he said his grandfather left it to him in a will and he wanted to know the date I did it. And uh, two weeks later, I got a call from Seattle, and that guy had bought one in an uh, auction of John Wayne print that I did years ago, and he wanted to know the same thing. 
then we had a guy from uh, Greenville uh, uh, recently come to our studio and he wanted a portrait of he and his wife and he opened a briefcase and he said, Skip, I travel a lot. Mm -hmm. And he says, I brought you something I got in an antique shop in Oklahoma City last week. And it was a calendar I did 26 years ago. 46 years ago. 46 years yeah, ago. Yeah, a, a calendar I painted. And it was in great shape. And he gave it to us. And I wanted to pay him. He said, no, he didn't cost but five bucks. And so he gave it to us. And I got that. That's cool. So, so I got, I really have work in every state in the union. That is neat, isn't and that neat? And a lot of times when I'm in, in a place, I see some of my work. Now, I uh, had Mr. Self when I flew the last 10 years. And I remember we were up upstate New York and landed at an airport. And the group of, of Greenwood executives, we had to wait on their limousines or a little uh, bus or something to pick them up. And so each man walked around in the little terminal building, upstate New York, and looked at items for sale. Mm -hmm. The Statue of Liberty, you know how that you've seen sure, it. Sure, sure. And there was a glass case with some cups in it, coffee cups on sale. And they had a little cartoon on it about pilots. And Mr. Seth said, Skip, uh, you might want to buy this. He looked at one. And I said, no, I don't need to buy that. Look at the artist's name under it. And it was my name. I had done those cups. How about that? And they went all over. So I see things like that. Absolutely. And uh, Shirley and I, as we travel, we run into people that'll say, I got one of your paintings. So there it were. But the reason that, because I flew everywhere. Sure. And I painted between flights. So I'm my own market man. <laughs> you you know, it didn't cost me anything. That's Let the company cool. pay for it, right? Absolutely. And I know, you know, the last time you were here, we talked about a lot of the uh, interesting people that you had ferried back and forth and, yeah. and this type of thing. But, you know, I, I was thinking about, I uh, was reading over some of your history here, and I, I was thinking back to uh, World War II and, and how you ended up in the war and how you ended up becoming a pilot. I would have thought that would have been difficult to become a pilot. Well, it's a lot of, a lot of training. Yeah. I wanted to become one. And so uh, when the Pearl Harbor happened, I signed up like everybody else mm -hmm. to do something. And right. I signed up to be a pilot, and they said, you got two years of college? And I said, no, I got one. And they said, sorry, you got to have two years of college. So I thought, I'll just go home and wait and be drafted. Before I was drafted, though, they wrote me a letter and said, if you'll go to Camp Croft in Spartanburg and take a test and pass the test, we'll get you to that other year. So I took the test and passed, an all-day test. Wow. Not that hard, but it was all day. Then I had to go back two weeks later for my physical. Mm -hmm. And I took the physical and did everything, but the doctor at the very last said, Skip, you're four pounds underweight. Oh, my gosh. And I'm sorry. He said, I'll tell you what, if you'll go to lunch now, downtown Spartanburg, and eat all the bananas you can, come back. And I said, okay. And I went back. Wade, and he shook my hand and said, congratulations, you're in the Air Force. How many bananas did you eat, I don't know, <laughs> but I did buy them. I, I, I ate them, and I, all I needed was four pounds. Four pounds. And he got to write it down like he's supposed to. Okay. So then they sent me to Duquesne University in Pittsburgh to get the other year. Mm -hmm. But that only took three months. And th then I'm through college now, and I got two, two years. years of college. Then I go to Florida and get climb in the airplane for the first time. Yeah, but how did you get, how did they decide whether you were going to be able to fly planes or whether you were going to be a navigator or didn't they have all these different positions? Yeah, they that had real college graduates passing tests, math tests and uh, physics and they made good grades. Mm -hmm. Well, they took those boys and made them navigators and bombardiers and they took the dumb guys like me and we and made me pilots. I like that, but I was tipped off 
Oh, I was thinking you were tipped off. Yeah, in this I had time. a friend that, that went before me, an upperclassman. He says, Skip, don't make too good on that test. Miss a few, and you'll be a pilot. And it worked. So by playing, the dumb ones were actually the pilots. Yeah. I, I mean, if yeah, they were no, going to go weren't, We weren't dumb, dumb. but <laughs> we weren't, uh, uh, you know, science, great scientific people that... Uh, but the and people then, that, that did well in math became the navigators, yeah, and yeah. they were the ones, the navigator people were probably thinking, if I ace this test, I'll be the pilot, yeah, right? Because right. everybody wanted to be a pilot. Yeah, but I was already tipped off. Yeah. And I had I went through my training. You, I, I went to, uh, I remember just before graduation, they had, uh, they started washing out guys, pilots. Mm -hmm. And the, washing out means you fail. And you're almost graduating. You've been there six, uh, nine months, and you, they got to have the top, top, top people, and so they they eliminate quite a few. And the one, the way they did it, you you'd be assigned an airplane to go out and practice, and when you go out and practice, you might find a major or a colonel sitting in the back seat, and he'll say, "Good morning, I'm going with you." and they give you a test that you can't pass in the airplane. Wow. Now, I had a buddy that was a mechanic at that air base, and he was from Greenville, and he said, Skip, you better watch it, they'll get in your airplane. Well, that night before, they had a list of the numbers of the airplane you fly. Mm -hmm. And I'd get a, my number and call my buddy the mechanic, and he'd go out and put a red flag on that airplane. That means it can't go. And so the next morning, I'd get in that airplane and put the red flag in my pocket and take off. So I never had to take a check ride. I looked up. Now, you manipulated this whole thing, Skip Shelton. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but it worked. It worked. Yeah, yeah. Well, that's pretty cool. You know, you, you all your life, you had to be making friends. You had to know how to, how to network and make it happen. Yeah, I did. I had a lot of friends there. And... Uh, it seemed like every group I was ever assigned to, I could uh, could get get in the web with them. I enjoyed it. Yankees and Southerners, it didn't matter to me. So we uh, we had a good rapport, all of them. Must have. Hey, I'm here with the one and only Skip Shelton right here on WCRS. Let's hear a quick word from our sponsors, and we'll be right back. Hey, if you've got a question for Skip, give us a call, 229-7984. That's 229-7984. We'll be right back. Oh, oh, that's right. We are right here at Sharp Passes Gallery. I am talking to Skip Shelton. We are, we are talking a little bit about World War II. I tell you what, uh, I was just asking Skip how it... Uh, how, how it felt when, you know, he was able, you actually were going because you knew how to put the red flag on your plane and then take the red flag off because you had relationships, but then you had some of the guys in there that uh, didn't make it because they were, had the general or whoever flying behind them and they flunked the test. Yeah. They, you call it wash, being washed out. Washed and you see it, and I'm sure they had orders to cut the class down, maybe 50 percent or 30. And so those uh, uh, officers thought, well, how are we going to get rid of the guys? They're almost graduating. And so we didn't come up with, let's give them a, a tough check ride they can't pass. And I knew that if one of them got in, he would have me doing it. Now, when you go on a check ride, man, they can make you do things that you would, that'll finally get you. I went over a check ride one time, and the guy in the back seat, the uh, officer, uh, says, do a snap roll, and I did. Then he said, okay, now to do a slow, uh, a loop. I did. And then he said, do a uh, Shondell. I did. And I could do them well. Right. Then he said, I want you to do me a real slow roll, upside down, and hold it for about three to, to four seconds, hold it upside down. And I did, and when I did, I fell against the glass canopy. Wow. I had forgotten to lock my seat belt. <sighs> and when I got back over, I fell back in my seat, and I thought, I hope he doesn't see that. And so after the check ride, he said, uh, Cadet, you did fine, but I want you to go to the blackboard in front of all your buddies 
and write a hundred times, I will always fasten my seatbelt. <laughs> so that, yeah, that check right, stuff. he could have failed he me, could've. but uh, he liked me. Absolutely. Guess what his name was? What? Lieutenant Skipper. Lieutenant Skipper? Yeah. <laughs> what a name. Now, what about, you were telling me about a guy that, uh, who would, that got uh, washed, washed out. out. Yeah. And yet you already had cards. They'd already ordered your uniforms and everything. Yeah, and a ring. Right, and a ring. Yeah. Wow. Just like the Super Bowl ring. Had a ring that says you're a uh, lieutenant. You know, that was such a sense of pride back then. I, I mean, I can't imagine. Here you, you've signed up for World War II. World War II is going on. You were just excited about this? You didn't fear that you could be killed or anything? No, that was the last part. You First thing you're looking for is graduation. Right. I hope I'll make it. Because it's tough now. We had to climb walls. We had to, uh, we had little, uh, looks like little airplanes that had BB guns and we'd have to shoot clay pigeons from, uh, like machine guns. And there's a lot of ways that you could not make it. And sure. so you, you're under that pressure the whole time to pass. Then when you pass, uh, the next thing you know, you're flying, practicing uh, gun runs or, or shooting machine guns out of airplanes that you already learned to fly. So you got to uh, dive in on targets. You're too busy to really be frightened. It's amazing. It's amazing that... Uh that this went on, and then you were tell you were just telling me about flying in formation. My God, three feet off your wingtips? Yeah, we fly in feet. Of course, you couldn't hold three feet. It'd be run from three to six, and uh, you couldn't dare. You wouldn't dare touch each other because you really got a problem. So you're flying, looking out the window, and you've got a uh, hand on four throttles. That's that's your four engines. And you you look at that wingtip, and even over Berlin, you still look at that wingtip. You can't look down and see the smoke coming up. I can't remember looking down and seeing a, a building blown up. I, I out of the corner of your eye, you could see black smoke. Wow! But you couldn't look down and see what the bombs were hitting. Bombardier could, rest of them could. And how many people were in a plane? Nine. Nine people. Yeah. And that whole time, it was just very intense, I guess. Yeah. You got uh, Germans coming in, shooting at you. And you were saying you had, what, 81? How was it? Well, you got nine. You got, your, your men are maintaining nine machine guns. Top, belly, sides, tail, nose. And you got each one had uh, twin machine guns. And if we all in a tight formation like that diamond, and a fighter comes in, or, or ten fighters come in to attack us, they're going to have to get by 81 machine guns aimed at them. Wow. Phenomenal. Yeah. Phenomenal. And then to go back, at, go back, back at night, you were telling about going back and being so exhausted. Yeah. That you went back and you just flopped down on your, bunk, on your bed. That's the best way to describe it, flop down. <laughs> yeah, you flop down. And you got big old fur jackets and fur boots and all that, but you flopped down and didn't take off anything. Because you were tired. Six hours in that, doing the flying that formation. Mm -hmm. uh, you were beat. And, and then, of course, the very fact that a bunk on either side or one side, they'd come in and roll it up. Yeah, you had about ten cots on the side of that Quonset hut. You know why the Quonset hut is? Sure, hurt. yeah. Round. And you knew everybody, and you'd go to a chow with everybody. And the, when uh, a crew wouldn't come back, the uh, gr a ground personnel would go in and take their belongings, roll up the mattress, and uh, ship the stuff up to their family. But the next night, it'd be another guy on that new mattress. That had to be, at that point, that had to be an unnerving. It was a little bit uh, during when you ended in there. but. Still things happened. It was so cold, we had a pot bellied stove to heat that place. And uh, we were allotted coal. Allotted yeah. coal? Yeah. One lump or two? Oh, yeah, it would be big, big old lumps, but you, they'd come in and just give us so much. And I had a, my gunner, sergeant, top gunner, lived in another section of the, of the base. He was an enlisted man, and he found out where that coal pile was. 
and told me, and he would meet me at night, and we'd go there, and he would bend over and hold me. I'd climb over the fence and throw coal back, and we'd put it in bags and take it back to our barracks. I've done that, and that, that kept you pretty busy. Kept you pretty busy. I bet you were pretty popular. Yeah. <laughs> I'm in the good tent over here of the Quonset hut. Come on over. We're having playing cards tonight. It's warm and toasty. Yeah, that's about the way it was, but I stole coal. You s sold coal? Stole it. Stole it. I yeah. know you stole it. I yeah. thought you were going to tell me you could. Then you turned around no, and sold no, it. <laughs> and uh, all those men that I'm talking about are gone now. But I remember Carson. He was the man that, that went with me to steal coal. That is a phenomenal story. Yeah. Phenomenal good stuff. Hey, I'm here with Skip Shelton. We're going to join the news in progress. i got to get some more details. We'll be back. Don't you go away. Uh, are you a pirate or a pack rat? Do you have a vacation of a lifetime sitting in the attic? Or a college tuition hung on a wall? Or is a fabulous retirement hidden in your jewelry box? Bring those items to Sharp Facets Gallery. We can establish value and buy from you or sell for you. And so ends another chapter at Sharp Facets Gallery. 72 Bypass and on the web, sharpfacets.com. Oh, that's right. We are back here at Sharp Facets Gallery. I am talking to the one and only Skip Shelton. Artist, World War II, uh, cartoonist, lover of life. I tell you what, I'm very fortunate to be sitting here with you today, Skip. Thank you. I'm enjoying this very much. We were just talking about uh, some of the other things that you remember back when you were on your base uh, right there, what, 60 miles? North, north of London, of, yeah. yeah. North of yeah. London. Yeah. You want to share some of that with the volleyball and everything? Yeah, yeah. Uh, we'd play volleyball because it'd be daylight in the month of uh, June. Mm -hmm. It'd be daylight and uh, at midnight. As a matter of fact, I enjoyed watching the sun set and stop before setting and then start back up again. You know, well, I've you, never seen anything like that. Yeah, I yeah, love to watch the sun rise, yeah. but yeah. And you see the same sun, sun and it's, it hesitates like it was going to lunch and then come back up again because it's far north. Right. And then the Germans sent buzz bombs over and we'd be stopped. Well, what is that now? What's a buzz bomb? Bomb? That's a drone. A drone? A drone with an engine. I in thought it. drones were new today. Drones are different today, but they do everything and it's going to give us a problem. Right. You know, you're going to have a drone flying over this building someday and uh, one of the men in Washington say, I don't like the front of your building. <laughs> <laughs> That's going to be tough, isn't it? I figured they'd probably say, I see Ann Eller, what is she doing yeah. in there? <laughs> <laughs> That's what I'm worried about. Yeah, she's in her house. How can I'll she tell be you doing something this? that you might like is interesting. Glenn Miller was at my base, and we were friends. For real? Yeah. Yeah? Well, I'm going to tell you some more stuff now. Okay. Glenn Miller, when he left the United States, he, was, he volunteered to go with his band. And he left half the band in New York. And his head trumpet player was Charlie Spivak. Mm -hmm. And Charlie Spivak said, okay, I'll do it. And he took the other half and met, took the band and played the Chesterfield Hour and played at the Roosevelt Hotel. Okay. Glenn Miller's in London and England, where, where I am. Charlie Spivak stayed home with the band. Now, Glenn Miller gets killed on Christmas Day uh, by friendly fire. It's an excellent thing. And Charlie Spivak, of course, continued what he's doing. I'm home now, and I'm living in Greenville. And Charlie Spivak comes through Greenville. This is in the 60s. Okay. He comes through Greenville playing at the old fireplace. A nice I knew that's where you were going to say. Yeah. Big club. Right. And at that night, he came the first night. It so happened I had to make a talk to the Rotary Club at that place. And I, I saw Spivak listen to me. After the thing was over, Spivak introduced himself to me and said, Skip, I hope I can fly with you some to New York, Miami, and see my friends. 
And the reason he said that because he made it, he was hired permanently to stay there in Greenville. Mm -hmm. And so we became friends. How about that? Now, he gave me tapes that he would make, and I'd go home and practice with my clarinet with those tapes. Then, as sometimes he'd go on a trip to New York, and he'd say, Skip, tonight bring your clarinet when we come back. And I'd sit in with Speedback and play with him. And one night, uh, we played, and I was standing up front beside him, and he played Amazing Grace every night. Mm -hmm. And so this night he whispered to me and said, Skip, take the lead. And I, I did the lead on the clarinet of Amazing Grace. Now last year, Shirley and I found a record in Abbeville recording by Charlie Spivak. And I had never seen it because I remember the night we recorded mm -hmm. and I never saw a record or anything, but I knew we recorded one night because I saw the wires and stuff. And Shirley found that album and it was a dollar. And we bought it and we didn't have anything to play that big record on, six, you know, sure. 78. So we went to Belks and bought one to play her. And today we have that and we play that record now and you can hear me playing Amazing Grace. Well, that kind of sends chills down my spine. That's kind of wild, isn't it? A little bit wild, yeah, but that's true. So to, to hear me playing now, and I, the record was, I think we played, made that record in 1968, and everybody in the band's dead and gone except me. But I'd play about every two weeks. Do you? Yeah. That's pretty cool. Playing with Charlie Spivak. Yeah. How about that? And I'm sure you've heard of it. Absolutely. Glenn Miller, Charlie Spivak, yeah, the whole group. And uh, it was an uh, exciting thing. And I became friends with Russo, who was his head sax man and clarinet. Mm -hmm. And we became friends and we played golf. And so one night, I played golf, one day, I played golf with Russo. Mm -hmm. And he said, Skip, you gonna play with us tonight? And I said, I think I will. And so I did. And left on time at midnight. And Charles Feedback went to his home. Russo likes to stay there and have a drink or two while the waitresses are cleaning up and the place was robbed and Russo was murdered. Wow. And so and that like to kill Spivak. And so later I did a portrait of Russo and on WFBC, remember Monty Dupuy? Mm -hmm. yeah. We presented Spivak with a, my portrait of uh, Russo and then Spivak gave me Russo's clarinet Wow. And I had that at home here today. God, you've got so many great stories. They're pretty good. They are pretty yeah. good. You are absolutely right. They're marvelous. Hey, I'm Ann Eller. I'm right here with uh, Skip Shelton. We're going to hear a quick word from our sponsors when we come back. Oh, I need to take a minute to adjust to all this info I have just received. We'll be oh, right back. That's right. We're right back here at Sharp Facets Gallery. Hey, you may know a lot of things about Skip Shelton, but do you know he was also a, took violin for, how many years did you take violin? Eleven. Eleven years. And you played with the Greenville Symphony? Yeah. And how old were you? I guess seventeen. Seventeen? Eighteen. Wow. And then you uh, auditioned for, uh, for the radio station up there? Yeah. I guess, so what happened then? I got uh, a program every Tuesday night, hour, no, 30 minute program, 8 o'clock, Skip Shelton and his violin. You know, those were the good old days, Skip, I'm sorry, those were just the yeah, good old days, good, weren't they? Good days, yeah. I mean, I remember, I've looked at some of the, uh, the uh, Index Journal, had a whole page ad, or not a whole page, but their whole front page the day that WCRS opened. Yeah. Returning programming, you know, when they had, uh, oh gosh, all this great half hour programming all day long, and then they had local stuff too. It was such a different day for yeah. everything, wasn't it? Yeah, it was good. It was good. And then uh, I'd ride that police motorcycle, do my disc jockey show every day, WSC. Then at one o'clock I'd go to my office in the Greenland News 
and I was her staff artist. So, you had a big advantage. You were a police officer for, for what did you tell me? Eight years. Eight years. Yeah. Eight years. You were a police officer. You went there, and then you had a show where you were a disc jockey. I guess you said you played big band on the radio. Yeah. Yeah. Was that during your dinner break? Yeah. Yeah. That was your dinner break. And and I can remember interviewing Lionel Hampton. For real. Yeah. Just like you're doing me right now. Exactly. Yeah. That's cool. But uh, you did that for an hour, and then you went back to police work. Yeah. <laughs> and then you worked, what did you say, till 1 o'clock in the morning or something, and you'd go? Art in the art department of the Greenwood News. I was the artist. And how old were you then, roughly? Oh, I was uh, active. It's right after the war, 26, 27. Phenomenal. Phenomenal. Yeah. But how was it to have Glenn Miller on the base where you were over there in London? Well, great, great, because we everybody loved his music, you know, and he would do concerts on our base, and they'd take buses and go to London and bring girls to the base for dancing. Oh, that was a big plus now, yeah, wasn't it? Yeah, we'd have bust over girls from London. <laughs> you couldn't hear them. You wouldn't understand what they're talking about, but they'd dance well. <laughs> I couldn't understand what they were talking about. <laughs> Well, that was cool. Yeah. So that was a big plus. Not everybody had that at all the bases no, there. No. Uh -uh. So what did you like about London, though? When you were in, the, when you were over there, what did you like about London? The shops. The shops. Yeah, down uh, Bond Street, I think it was called. Mm -hmm. uh, that was a big uh, shopping yeah. area. Yep. Yeah, in uh, Trafalgar Square and Piccadilly Circus. Yep. You know, so, yeah, it was pretty nice. Now, I understand you, you actually rode bicycles, right? Yeah, but not to London. Not to London. We'd take them to Norwich, to the train station. We'd like our bicycles and get on the train and go to London. And how'd you like the fish and chips? I liked it. Still do. Still like fish yeah. and chips. Well, have you ever been back to London? No. I want to take Shirley one day and let her see the base. And now, I'll tell you a, a story that recently happened to Shirley and I were in Greenville at a home show, mm -hmm. and five people were uh, walking behind us, and one was in a wheelchair, and that people were elderly, mm -hmm. and they saw this jacket that you're looking at right, right here. Right. And so one of the ladies said, did you fly in England? I said, yeah. She says, where were you stationed? She says, we're from England. We were visiting Greenville. She says, where were you based? And I said, see them. I said, you ever heard of it? She says, I lived there. <laughs> and she says, when I was a little girl, I watched you guys take off every morning, and I'd wait in the yard till you came back. And I said, so you and I have been close together before, 80 years ago. Isn't that something? That is something. You know, it really amazes me. You know, the thing that bothers me about today's, today's people, though, it doesn't seem like we're getting that same rich experiences. I'm not talking about the war, but I'm, t I'm talking, that is part of it, but about all the things in, that you have. The Spivak, the Glenn Miller, the playing the clarinet, the violin. I mean, yes, it's exceptional. But I know many older people who just seem to have lived life to the fullest. Don't you? Th what do you think about today? I think they're missing a lot because they don't do enough. You got to get out of that chair. Yeah. You know, TV's hurt a lot of people. You can sit there and get tied up in that chair and not do anything. But I used to get up and do things, and Shirley and I do now. No, I think it makes a difference, but I, I don't. I think that some of it is. Don't you think that a lot of people, we don't experience, I and mean, I don't think we have the friendships and stuff that we did. Obviously, from being in the army and everything, you develop very close relationships with the guys that you flew yeah. with and everything. But you know, you can still do that today, really. Yeah. Now, Shirley and I, uh, we like Greenwood. She's from Greenwood, and I'm now I am ten years. And everywhere we go now, if we go to a store and buy something, we know the the, the people who sell it to us. Sure. We know who the people are that feed us uh, in Old Charlie's or sure. wherever. Yeah, we're the same way. Yep. Yeah, and uh, it's nice that you got all these friends now, kind of helping us along. So it can be done if you go out and. and and make yourself do it. 
you know, you, you. I worry about so many of our young people closing themselves off. They do all the Facebooking and all the social networking, but are they really getting to know people and experience life? No, they're not, are they? I don't think so. I think most of them are on these doggone computers. Right. You know, now I got a friend in Greenville, one of my pilots, who's still flying. Right. And he, through some uh, marriage thing, he obtained a, a new grandson, 12 years old or 11. Sure. And he wants to be nice to that. And so my friend owns his own airplane and took the little boy several weeks ago for his first airplane flight. That's nice. Neat. No, it's not nice. The little boy never looked out the window, but he stayed on his iPhone the whole time. See, that's, that's ridiculous. That's what I mean. He didn't, We're not... he didn't know he was in an airplane. Well, that's a shame. But he knew about that game on that iPhone. Yeah, that's what I mean. That's bad. It is bad. It is bad because there is too much to experience, but you have to open yourself up to it. Yeah. And I think a lot of people are afraid today in today's world. They don't get out and experience the world because they're afraid of this or they're afraid of that. We have a society that is going that way. But I am glad to see that I am sitting here today with Skip Shelton. Now, how about, have you ever been on an honor flight? No. No. I think you ought to do. I think you would have a blast because Probably. you would know so many. Even if you didn't know the people, y'all would have such similar experiences. Yeah. Yeah. You were telling me that uh, you have a friend that's going on one, and you're supposed to be writing a letter. Yeah, my my bombardier. Your bombardier. Okay. Yeah. And he lives in Wisconsin. Uh, Wisconsin. Yeah. And they wanted you to uh, write a letter to. Him. I guess to be read on the airplane. I guess I'll write a letter about. How we feel or how we live with each other, yeah. you know. I, I can, I can say this about him and my other crew members. Three of us still living, and Lenny comes. He comes here occasionally to see me. Mm -hmm. He and his wife. Now, when I hear America played in some of these places we go last week, we heard a concert in Greenville. They played America, and all. I kind of get a lump in my throat. But I always think of Lenny when I do that. He's your bombardier that went through the war with you, and we still just like that. No, that's tremendous. You know, I, do you think you form relationships like that? I mean, and don't you think being in war or something makes those relationships special, doesn't yeah, it? Yeah, yeah. Do you ever look back at what you did now that you're out of the war? You said you're, you weren't scared when you were in the war because you knew what you were supposed to be doing. Do you ever think back and think, how the heck did we ever get through this? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I'll be scared today. I'm scared to go down Montague today. <laughs> <laughs> you have a right or be on the bypass. Take your life in your hands. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But yeah, I think you would really enjoy it if you took an honor flight. It, I went on one last year. It was absolutely a phenomenal experience. And uh, the stories and everything and the camaraderie of the guys, just great just great so I hope you will take a take a look at it and we'll see about I'll it I think that would be a fun fun day for y'all it's a long day it's a hard day but I tell you what it is priceless so um, what do you got coming up that you're going to be doing here Skip well we got a call today for another mural out on the lake in a man's basement he wants a nice mural that's coming up and uh, we got some more murals downtown to do and we got, uh, you know, I've done a, a watercolor of all the churches here in the city, most all of them. Mm -hmm. And I do prints, and they're on sale at Thayer's. And so they, every week, it seems like we do, well, we replace in a church that was sold, and they, it's kind of nice. Are you still teaching? Yeah, we have uh, two classes a week. Two classes a week? Yeah. We yeah. got about 20 something students. What, what is the most, um, what's the best part of teaching? To see how well they do. For, uh, for example, we got a girl at Ware Shows, and well, she's been taken, and today she's at uh, St. Augustine in an art college. Wow. And that makes you feel good. We got two more girls at Ware Shows, and believe it or not, they're almost as good as I am. That makes you feel good to see that what they've got and what they've done. 
That must be uh, must make you feel good to be able to be able to pass something like yeah. that on because that's hard sometimes to translate it. Yeah, and that there's a, one little factor that uh, happens when you teach like that. You'll start learning some things again yourself because they'll get you in trouble, and you got to get them out. Yeah. <laughs> And the first thing you know, you're a better artist. Better artist. So when they get in trouble, it helps you if you can get them out. Get them out there. Well, well, you know that's great. So um, I can't tell you how much I enjoy sitting down and talking with you, Skip. It's always a pleasure to have you here. I wish we had a Glenn Miller record to play now. I or, wish or we a theme did. Song. <laughs> <laughs> the next time you come, I'll be sure to have one. How about that? Okay. I love Glenn Miller okay. and the old. I love big band music. I wish there was more of it. I love that. Yeah, I do too. I do. All right. Well, we are here with Skip Shelton. We've had a great time today. He's painted a lot of good stuff. He continues to paint. He never seems to quit. Valentine's Day is here. What keeps him young? You want to tell me those three things that keep you young one more time? I think everybody needs to hear this. Well, you got to have somebody to love. You got to have something to do. And you got to have something to look forward to. And you've got all three. Yeah. You're a lucky man. Yeah. Absolutely. Well, Skip, thanks so much for being with us here today. This is WCRS right here in Greenwood. You know, Valentine's Day is coming up on Thursday. What are you going to do for your sweetie? I certainly hope you're going to come by and see us right here at Sharp Facets Gallery on the 72 Bypass. By the way, I want to thank our sponsors that helped with those fantastic gift baskets that we gave away on Friday afternoon. Gosh, who was it? It was the pantry with a Valentine's cake. Wicker, wicker and floral. Rose over there is doing some fabulous floral arrangements. Capri's Dinner for Two. The uh, Piedmont Tech Massage Therapy is doing one-hour massages. And Sharp Facets Gallery, $75 gift certificate. And don't forget Frank's Car Wash with Deluxe Car Washes. So all of these things were in those baskets. Thank you, sponsors, so much. When you're out there trying to figure out what to do for Valentine's, how about shop with our sponsors? That's going to do it for us. This is WCRS right here in Greenwood. Thank you so much, Skip, for coming on the show. Good. I enjoyed it. Bye-bye. All right. That'll do it for us. Bye-bye, everybody.